Yeah. So I call this Wall Street Goes Green. So, I mean, it, like historically, anti uh, fossil fuel activists are always trying to persuade voters and lawmakers to pass anti fossil fuel policies. But in, le- in recent years, one of the tactics that they've taken is trying to harm fossil fuel companies without having to bother winning over the public. And one way this has been happening is through shareholder activism. So if you're an anti-fossil fuel activist, you can buy shares in Chevron or Exxon or Shell. And then one of the things you can do is have these shareholder proposals trying to force them to do destructive things to their companies, like stop new fossil fuel projects or endorse anti-fossil fuel policies. And now, like these are not you know millions and millions of shareholders, but they've been successful at winning over the big mainstream shareholders like BlackRock and Vanguard by tying themselves to this what's called ESG, Environmental, Social, and Governance Investing Criteria. And so it's kind of like socially responsible investing, but like socially responsible investing used to say like, hey, don't invest in this thing because it's immoral. And a lot of people invest because they want to make the most returns possible. And indeed for things like a, um, you know, retirement or pension fund, they sometimes have legal restrictions that would prevent them from doing anything that's not in the financial interests of their members. But what ESG says is no, wait, if you, it, it turns out that actually companies that are socially responsible are more profitable in the long run and companies that are not socially responsible as measured by these environmental, social, and governance criteria, they're actually long-term threats to people. And so being socially responsible is really just being profitable. And so what you've gotten is you get these major investors like BlackRock and Vanguard supporting shareholder resolutions that are can be really harmful to fossil fuel companies. And the, the latest development here is that the credit, credit agents, ratings agency Fitch is now saying that, look, our bond ratings, we're going to show how they're tied to ESG. And you know they found that 23% of their ratings are influenced by ESG criteria. And 3%, just one ESG criteria has led to a change in the bond rating, which simply means if I'm a fossil fuel company and I get a bad environmental rating by Fitch, it's going to be a lot harder for me to raise money and engage in new projects. And okay, well, you know that would be one thing. But if you look at the actual ESG standards, they're incredibly biased. And I'll just give one example. So... um one of the shareholder resolutions that activists have pushed for are companies reporting on their their climate risk. And what are their biggest climate risks that they have to concede in these reports? Well, it's that basically they're going to face radical restrictions on fossil fuels and or they'll be outcompeted by solar, wind, and batteries. And like the, if, if you actually were a fossil fuel company and said, hey, we're not actually going to be that profitable because we face these risks, your share price is going to collapse. And so uh, the, 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 when, when you actually look at these standards, they're not written to really give an objective evaluation of the long-term health of companies. Like they're literally written by environmentalists and other kind of like egalitarian activists. And now that you have even companies like Fitch who are basically forcing companies to meet these standards, it's really bad because it means investors are going to make bad decisions, including the people who run our pension and retirement funds. And it means that it's going to be harmful to companies who are producing energy that we all need. So you want to comment just for a minute about what we've been doing in this space? Yeah. So most of our work has focused on helping companies deal with these reporting requirements. And our basic view is that instead of giving a biased assessment of how like, how much are you harming the environment versus how much you used to a year or two ago, it's saying that what companies should report on is, is the full context of their human impacts. And so like you came up with this great term, human impact reporting, where you look at the positives, including the the benefits of affordable, abundant energy to human beings, as well as taking a look at the negatives, including potential risks that are involved in climate. And that, that by looking at the full context, that's what's going to give investors the best ability to assess your long-term prospects. And because I think what these companies are actually doing is overall beneficial and will be vital for a long time, it is good for the companies. And 
in a really honest way. And so I think like that's, you know, um, we've, you know, worked with companies try to try to implement full context reporting as it's called. But then, I mean, I think there's a hard question of what companies are going to do given the reality that they're forced to adhere to these really biased standards in the short term. Yeah. At least what we've advocated is that people should take the high ground in terms of the framework of it. And just as I mentioned in at the beginning of today's show, that we need a, a framework that includes seeking the full context for evaluating claims of others or evaluating issues for ourselves. So when a company is reporting on anything, which is one of the key principles has to be seek the full context and report the full context. And one of the the things that a company today can be virtually sure of is that when the green movement asks it to do something, or even when a conventional, not exactly green entity, like let's say Larry Fink and BlackRock or Vanguard or State Street, when these things are being asked in the mainstream knowledge system, they're going to be asked for in a way that is seeking the negative context, and also that has these fundamental assumptions about nature as fragile, and that has a lot of the minimum human impact goal built in. And thus, if it, to the extent those things are, are, are baked in to a request, those are bad for the company and they are bad for humanity. But what we what we found is that it is it's possible for the company to reframe the thing and to say, look, hey, we're we're ultimately talking about our impact on human flourishing, and we're really talking, and that can be positive and negative. It's not just negative, and it's not even just negative environmentally. There can be a lot of positive impacts there, and we're going to be as even handed and precise as we can. And then if you do that, it gets a lot of credibility and helps reframe the discussion. 